Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 299 of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have Dave Kimura. Hey, how's it going? Jason Sweat. Hello. Brian Hogan. Hi, everyone. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv, and this week we have a special guest, and that's Bob Zeidman. Hi, everybody. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. Do you want to introduce yourself since we haven't had you on the show before? Uh, sure. So, uh, Bob Zeidman, uh, what can I tell you? I've got a company that consults on intellectual property litigation, that Zeidman Consulting. And I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I know a lot about software intellectual property. I wrote a textbook on it, created some software tools that are for finding intellectual property infringement, and that's sold through my software company. And our consulting company, we basically uh, assist attorneys and clients when there's a litigation over patents, trade secrets, or copyrights, hardware or software. And uh, we're basically the people they hire to read the patents and go through the software and find out do things infringe, was code copied, were trade secrets stolen, and then I typically testify about it in court if it goes to court. This episode is sponsored by Compose.io. Databases are arguably the most difficult part of the stack to manage. The last thing you want is to wake up at 4 a.m. because the database failed and you have no backups. Compose has all that covered for you, so rest assured that your database is fast, reliable, and always on. It's production-ready cloud databases on AWS and GCP for SoftLayer. So go check them out. You can pick from nine databases, including MongoDB, Elasticsearch, Redis, RethinkDB, MySQL, and one of the latest, ScyllaDB, which is a fast drop-in replacement for Cassandra. All databases come with guaranteed RAM, IOPs, and CPU that auto-scale. Automatic daily and on-demand backups, high availability nodes, security you can count on with, with private VLAN, IP whitelisting, SSH and SSL, two-factor authentication, and much more. Deploy your database in minutes, and they'll take care of all of the administrative tasks like patches and upgrades. Set up is fast and easy, so go try them out for 30 days free at compose.com slash devchat. That's really interesting. I remember when I was in college, um, I studied computer engineering and I was going to go into intellectual property law. So I know at least the basics. Um, I actually interned writing patent applications. Woo, fun. Um, <laughs> which convinced me that that wasn't what the career route that I wanted to follow. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm kind of curious um, if you could just briefly explain when we're talking about intellectual property with uh, with software, what are we talking about? Because, I, I mean, I know there's copyright, there's trade secrets, and there's um, patents. And mm -hmm. they all mean slightly different things. Sure. First, I just wanted to point out that, uh, you know, people who uh, write patent called, uh, you know, patent attorneys, patent agents, they, it's called prosecuting. Uh, I don't know. They like what they do. You've really got to like delving into details and analyzing every word. And I can do it, but I wouldn't want to do it as a career. Uh, but right. the litigators, the litigators, the people who litigate that go to court, very, very different kind of people. They're also very smart, um, very detail oriented, but these are like the, the guys uh, and gals that you want to hang out with and have a good time because when they're not litigating, not all of them, but they're not <laughs> litigating, they're very boisterous, joking, slappy on the back, you know, and they love getting them up in front of court and, uh, you know, arguing with each other and arguing with the, the the witnesses, whereas the people who write the patents are usually pretty quiet and, you know, just they love to be by themselves and just delve into their work. So it's very, two very different kinds of people. So, yeah, there's, uh, you know, basically the three kinds of intellectual property protection for software are copyrights, trade secrets, and patents. So the important thing about copyrights is that uh, copyrights have existed since the Constitution was developed over 200 years ago in the U.S., uh, and they protect the actual code itself. So uh, it keeps the code from being copied. So if an employee of one company goes and takes some code with him or her to another company and uses it, that's copyright infringement because they've copied the code. It doesn't matter what the code does. It, they do have to copy a substantial part and a creative part, and that's where people can argue about whether it's creative or uh, substantial. But almost all software is substantial because the argument is if you took a piece out, even one line of code, unless it's a comment, uh, if you took a line of code out, the program would stop working. And some programmers might get upset about that, or they might say, well, this section isn't very creative. It was just pretty ordinary code. But the legal definition of creative is 
if there were many ways of doing it and you chose one, then that's creative. In other words, if, uh, you know, if you have to type a number in binary, you know, or, or calculate pi out to a thousand digits, there's no creativity because every digit is determined. You know, that's an extreme of not creative. But in code, if you could have a for loop or a while loop or, you know, uh, some other, you know, recursive uh, function call and you could list a bunch of ways of doing it, and that means that you chose one as creative because uh, you had a lot of options and they were all equally good, but you liked one better than the other. Well, so. I just realized that I know nothing about this stuff. I thought <laughs> I did, but now I'm just full of doubt. <laughs> That's why we do well, these shows. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I've kind of felt that a lot of programmers don't understand the legal issues. And so sometimes they say, oh, that wasn't creative, but you had to choose something and choosing means it's creative. That one of the judges once said, a famous judge, I don't recall who, said that it's a very low bar for creativity um, right. from a legal point of view. So creativity isn't our definition of clever code. It's just... I had to make a decision here and the code does something important. So copyright. Right. And, and one of the ways of looking at it is if you had a hundred ways of doing it, in fact, I was in a case where this happened. If you have a hundred ways of doing it, you chose one <clears throat> and then somebody decided to copy it. The argument is, well, there were 99 ways you could have done it that didn't copy. So you must've had a reason for copying it. And that's wrong. Yeah. I was in a case once where, I found copying of a routine that was a standard search routine. It's it searched for characters within a string. <clears throat> and I was working for the plaintiff and the defendant side came back and said, look, a paper was published in 1979 about this algorithm and you can go online. And we actually found 3000 implementations of this code. And it's interesting because sometimes the lawyers don't realize that their arguments working against them. Because when I got up, I said, well, you had, 2,999 ways of doing this that wouldn't be a copyright infringement. And I think you chose, <laughs> I, but you chose the one that was. And I think the reason you chose it was because you knew that it worked within the entire program. So you didn't have to do extensive testing of it. Right. This is one of the things that I've always been real wary of as a consultant, because you see you know, you're doing something for, for a client and you, you, you go, gee, can I reuse that? You know, can I reuse that in another project? And, and you're kind of like, you, you need to go talk to some people to find out if you can actually use that because of that reason. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's why when I, when you're talking client versus employer for me, um, as a consultant, um, you know, I, I give them a license to use the code, but I retain the copyright. And that way, if I do need to use the code somewhere else, I can because I own it. They don't. Um, they just have the right to use it for as long as they want and modify it in any way that they want. Um, but yeah, um, with employers, usually you wind up signing the, that copyright to them, and that way they can do whatever they want with it, but you don't actually own it anymore, so you don't have the right to take it with you. It depends right. on the size. It depends on the size of the legal team of the person you're consulting That's for, true. too. Because sometimes, sometimes they'll see that clause. Because I've had that happen to me. They'll see that clause in the contract and go, "Nope, sorry, uh, you're writing this code as a work for hire. We want this. We we yeah. want the full use of this code. We want to own the code you're doing." So it, it, you know, whoever, whichever side has the has the bigger legal team is usually the one that wins that argument for me. And in, in my experience, <laughs> you know, true. I. I you know, one thing I'd like to say about that is, uh, so first of all, I'll say that lawyers, I love lawyers for a lot of different reasons. One, they give me most of, you know, my consulting work comes all through lawyers. So they've been great. But I've had to hire lawyers when I've had issues for various things, and they've, they've helped me out on those. Uh, but one thing I've found uh, is that not enough companies push back against their lawyers. And so I've been I've done deals with companies where they say we need to pass we need to send this to our lawyers and the lawyers their job is to protect the company from any kind of potential problems in the future. So they'll look at that clause you mentioned they'll say no no can't do this. But they're not business people. And I I'm always frustrated with business people who said my lawyers won't let me do it. And the better business people the people who are, who, who do a better job in my mind are the people who say well if it makes business sense You've got to tell your lawyers, we're going to do it. How do we do it? 
in the with the least risk possible. So I think you shouldn't you shouldn't just yeah. blindly trust your lawyers because their job is to keep you safe, you know. But your job is to make your business grow and and have good relationships with people and clients and customers. Exactly. So the the other uh, the other two aspects of for software and intellectual property are patents, which a lot of people know. They're a little bit controversial. I think software patents are fine. I think there's a lot of bad patents that were issued, especially years ago, uh, software and non-software. But I don't think that's an issue having to do with software patents. It just has to do with the patent office issuing a lot of bad patents. Uh, they used to have an incentive to issue as many patents as they could. And they figured, I think the thinking was, hey, if we issue a bad patent, it'll go to court and uh, it'll they'll figure it out in court. Uh, but nowadays, uh, the pendulum swung the other way. It's actually very hard to get any patents, really hard to get software patents. Um, but I think that they're valid because I think people do create, you know, they do invent stuff with software that's really unique and that uh, deserves protection. <clears throat> So, so for uh, for for our audience, just just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, why would you choose to to go for a patent for something as opposed to just copywriting the work? Right. So, copyright is is only going to protect the actual code itself and not the concepts in it. So, you know, if you've got this great new, I don't know, compression algorithm, you can copyright the code, but if somebody Somebody can read the code, figure out what it does, and then reproduce it. In fact, in copyright law, one thing it's not always understood is that if you were to obtain software legally, that, that's the key. If you were to obtain it legally, the source code, you are legally allowed to read it, understand it, copy it for the sake of learning about it, copying it for the sake of teaching about it. Uh, but, you, but copyright law says you can't copy it. But what copyright law does say is you can learn how it works and then reproduce it, reproduce the functionality of it. Patents protect the functionality. So another another idea or another uh, way of explaining this is is that the implementation that you put into the code is copyrighted. You know the way you wrote the code in order to implement the ideas or the methods or algorithms behind it, that's all copyrighted. But if you invent a new algorithm. Or if you invent a new method of doing things, I mean, this is similar to the idea of business processes being patentable. Um, you know, where somebody invents a new way of doing something in their company, and it gives them um, a competitive a competitive advantage. And so, because it gives them a competitive advantage, you know, there is some, um, you know, there's a reason for people to invent it. And so, those algorithms, those processes, those ideas. Um, you know, that, that can be translated directly into code. Um, if somebody patents that, then it encourages uh, that invention. And that's the whole idea behind patents in the first place. And so, yeah, if, if you create a new way of doing something that gives you that competitive advantage, then you want to be able to keep your competitors from doing that uh, for the 20 years or so that your patent is good for. But I was under the impression that the idea behind going for a patent was often to to license that so you can create some revenue from the idea. You're not you necessarily trying to you're not necessarily trying to prevent someone from doing it. You're trying to prevent them from doing it without paying you money, right? Yeah, there are different um, strategies for taking advantage of a patent. Um, you know, pharmaceutical companies, for example, when they have a patent on a drug, they don't let anyone else make it. Um, or if they do, you know, they charge them a large license fee because it's very lucrative to be able to make that medication. Um, but, you know, in other cases, it's just, look, uh, this gives me such a powerful competitive advantage that I just don't want anyone else to be able to do it. And so it really, it really boils down to how you think you can best monetize it and what your goals are with the invention. Yeah, yeah, that's basically the, the one, a couple of things I wanted to add to that is, is that patents, uh, in return for this protection, the government says that you have to explain to everybody how the patent works, mm -hmm. how the invention works. And so you avoid the situation that happened centuries ago where people would die with their inventions and nobody knew how it works, so you couldn't build on it. 
So from a developer perspective, you know, let's say if I work at Twitter and I have full access to the source code there and I decide to leave the company because I don't agree with their direction and I think I can build a much better version of that from a developer perspective. And I think this may hit home with some of the listeners because I think that a lot of them are, you know, just uh, developers for a company. What what kind of risks do they run, even if they take zero source code with them from their previous employer? What kind of risks do they encounter with developing their own similar product uh, with the same concept or idea? So there's there's a risk about uh, infringing patents and misappropriating trade secrets. So if the if the thing that they are using from the old company is patented, then <laughs> they could be accused of patent infringement. Now, if they improve on what the other company was doing, then it's a little bit gray, but it's probably not patent infringement if the you know if the thing that they're improving on was patented, unless it incorporates the invention and it like adds to it, then it could still be patent infringement. So they need to be careful about that. But then there's also the trade secrets. Trade secrets are kind of interesting because almost anything that's a competitive advantage can be a trade secret. It can be your software. It can be who to sell your software to, who the customers are, how much to charge, how much not to charge. Uh, there's something called negative know-how, which is like, uh, you know, if you tested a whole bunch of algorithms and you tested six of them and five didn't work, then... Uh, if you start a new company and automatically use that sixth algorithm, that you can be charged with uh, trade secret misappropriation, not only for using that algorithm, but for knowing to skip the other five because they didn't work. Um, so trade secret is is kind of a gray area, and it's always a risk for anybody starting a new company. You know, with patents, you can look up the patents and see what they are, work around them. That's one of the reasons you've got patents. You work around them. Uh but trade secrets are stickier. And to be perfectly honest, if uh, if somebody leaves a company and starts a new company and that company, no matter what it's doing, becomes a hundred million dollar company or bigger, they're probably going to get sued for trade secret theft uh, just to uh, try to get a chunk of that revenue. I mean, it's a little bit cynical. I shouldn't say that always, you know, it doesn't always happen, but there are occasions when that happens. A company says, hey, this guy just started something. He must have taken something from us. Let's start a case and uh, we'll figure out during the case what he stole from us. Or if, he, if we can't figure it out, we'll at least try to negotiate for a piece of his, a chunk of his company. I mean, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Uh, judges are supposed to, if you can't show what the, what the person took as it, and you can't show it's a trade secret, the judge is not supposed to allow it to go to court. But unfortunately, you can almost always find an expert who's willing to claim that they took, uh, you know, we know they took some function which nobody else knew. And, uh, and let me give you a concrete example. I was I worked on a trade secret case where uh, the it was actually two two people started a company, a software company, and they had a meeting with a very large software company showed them what they'd done. The large software company said, hey, that's interesting. We'll pay you $50,000 for it. And by the way, it was just a Visual Basic add-on to Microsoft Outlook. And the people turned down $50,000. They tried to get funding and start their business. They failed. And they came back and sued for $30 million, saying that the big company had stolen their, stolen their trade secrets. And the only thing they could show were some functions laid on top of Microsoft Outlook, which didn't really do very much. But they found an expert who uh, said, oh, yeah, this, this was very inventive and the large company wouldn't have known how to do it. Now, now one more thing I'll add. D emails are not always discoverable in court. It depends on where you are and what kind of case it is and, and what the laws are at the time. But at that time, emails were discoverable, which meant we went in and asked to see the emails from the people who were claiming that trade secrets were stolen. 
And they had emails back and forth with their testifying expert when they hired him. Uh, they said, here's the information. We'd like you to be our expert. And his response was, oh, yeah, sure. What kind of case is it? It's obviously not a trade secret case because this stuff is well known. So what kind of case is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then later he later he wrote a report about how these, you know, this was very inventive stuff that was, you know, that they didn't want their competitors to get their hands on. Interesting. Yeah. So the, the main thing is, I think you always want copyright protection, which, by the way, you can send a tiny chunk of code to the copyright office and pay thirty five dollars and you've got a registered a registration for your copyright. You have the copyright once you finish the code, but it's better to register it with the government. <clears throat> so for thirty five dollars, you send a little portion of your code and you've got the whole thing registered with the copyright office. And then you decide if you want a patent. <clears throat> you've got to pay some money. It's a long process. It can take years and you may not get the patent, but if you do, you're going to have to release your algorithms, you know, your invention to the public, but you get really strong protection for roughly 20 years. But if you think that, you know, that 20 years isn't enough, that your code's going to be useful for 50 years, let's say, or you just don't want anyone to know how the code works because they'll figure out a way around it or a different way of doing it, then you want to keep it as a trade secret. But you have to make sure that people sign non-disclosures and that the, you know, that you take precautions because if you go to court and they say, hey, look, you showed everybody your code and now you're saying it's a trade secret. Well, if you showed it to people, it's not a secret and then you, you lose all protection for it. That's interesting. So how does a developer protect themselves uh, from a previous employer from a trade secret? It sounds like it's almost a losing battle. Well, one thing that I tell people is, and, and even with patents, to be perfectly honest, I, I always recommend that entrepreneurs starting a company get at least one patent because it's like an insurance policy. It helps get investors if your company goes under, you could still have a very valuable patent. But with everything else, you you mark documents that you think are important. You if you're not sure if a document's important, then mark it confidential. Uh, you know, even if you're not sure, uh, keep your code uh, in some kind of secure place. Make sure that your employment agreement says that people are to keep code and documents confidential. Things like that, uh, and basically. Nobody's going to sue you for trade secret theft or patent infringement until you're successful. So once you're successful, if it happens, you can hire the lawyers. I mean, you should take all the precautions not to do the wrong thing. But if you if you get sued, you can get sued for patent infringement, even though you did nothing wrong. You just weren't unaware of the patent. And you might not really infringe. And trade secret, you might not have done anything wrong, but you could get sued. But you don't have to worry about it when you're a startup. There's a rumor that startups get sued out of business by like patent trolls. But believe me, I know all the patent trolls. I worked for them and against them. And a patent troll is not going to sue a company that's not making money because there's no point to it. They'll waste $5 million against a company that can't pay. Um, so nobody ever put a, a startup out of business with a patent suit. Uh, this this is yeah. just to, this is just entirely anecdotal, but I did work for a yeah. startup. The, I, I did work for a startup that uh, about five years ago that uh, no longer exists because the, of the threats of lawsuits from a very large uh, organization, and we folded because of that. So just anecdotal. Sure. Let, let me tell you what you know. And I should take it back. There was, I was once in a small market where the whole market was maybe fifty million dollars or maybe thirty million dollars years ago. There were three companies in the space. The biggest one must have been a $10 million company, and they sued their competitors out of business for patent infringement. So it does happen, but it's extremely rare. But they were, you know, nobody had a big share of the market. Although the company I worked for, turns out they had an insurance policy that covered the court cases. And this is the risk. The company that, that sued them couldn't, ended up not being able to afford to fight the case that they had started because my company, my the company I worked for, had an insurance policy that covered it. And so the big company went out of business. And uh, the company I worked for became the big player in the market because of that. So that, that, 
that is that is in my definition sweet sweet justice right there. yeah yeah it was. <laughs> so so i shouldn't say it doesn't happen but it's pretty rare but the other thing is people get scared of patents and just like any you can be threatened i don't know if this happened to you, but this you know well i don't know if it's happened to me but well, I know that verbally it has. I've gotten into contract disputes with companies that say, we're going to sue you. And I say, OK, go ahead. And it's rare that anybody does it because to do that is so much money and so much effort. Um, so there are a lot of threats out there to do it. But I think very few companies follow through on it. Yeah, it was really unfortunate because this was uh, this was education related. And so the big the big player, the big player threatened and uh, the uh, the CEO said, yeah, bring it. And they brought it. Oh wow! And it was like it was like oh okay. And uh, just just from talking with other people who've tried the same kind of thing, uh, that's that's what that player that's what that player does to stay on top of the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I shouldn't say it never happens. It does. But the other the other thing is that's why I advise that every startup have at least one patent because then you can counter sue. Now you've got you've got to have the money for it. But you know there there are ways of keeping it. There are ways of fighting. You know, you can use it as leverage for negotiating, basically. I've done this myself. As long as you've got a case, if they sue and you countersue, then you say, okay, now we can talk. Because neither side really wants to go to court, typically. You know, there are exceptions. Yeah, no, I'm sure they didn't really want to, but it's, you know, if you have an effective strategy, you know, you tend to, you tend to use that. I think eventually this, this company is going to find someone that will stand up to them and yeah, that will happen. I mean, I, and I have seen that. I worked in a trade secret case that I felt really bad about. I worked for the defendant. But what happened was the plaintiff gave the defendant, asked the defendant to develop some code for them. And the plaintiff was a really big company. And the defendant was a startup, but they were making a lot of progress. That was the difference. So they were starting to grow. And the big company came to the little company and said, can you develop this code for us? And after you develop it, we'll pay you your development costs, but you can use it as much as you want. And that was specifically in the contract. It was very explicit in the contract. So my client developed this code, gave it to the big company at cost, and then started successfully selling it to some major players in the market. When the big company saw this, they turned around and sued the little company for trade secret theft. And the worst part was that the judge really didn't understand what was going on. The big company found an expert that without even looking at the code said it that my client's code infringed the trade their the big company's trade secrets and the judge not knowing what was going on split the baby and said okay you can have these trade secrets and you can have these trade secrets and the 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 long story short is that my client struggled and struggled and struggled to rewrite the code from scratch um, and ended up well my company ended up getting bought and so it wasn't a terrible ending, but the only way they could survive was getting funding from another company to have help them rewrite their code and get out of this case that dragged on for a long time. And it was it was really the whole situation was unethical, the suit in the first place. But the reason they sued was my client was starting to take customers away from them, really big customers. And they would have been a huge company if it weren't for this lawsuit. That's interesting. I, I think we've kind of gone into the area that a lot of people talk about with patents, and that's you know people suing other people over the patents. And in particular, you know, when when we talk about patents, we we go into the area of quote unquote patent trolls, um, you know, or non practicing entities. Uh, do do you kind of want to explain how they operate and why they are good or bad? Right. So I'm. I'm of the opinion that they're actually good. Uh, they don't no! always. Do. <laughs> let, let me let me explain though. Here's here's an issue. There's patent trolls are used to as a term for anybody that's using a patent and you don't like them. So there are patent trolls who send out letters to little shops and say, "Pay us ten thousand dollars, or we're going to sue you." And most little tiny companies, mom and pop shops, they can't afford a lawyer to defend them in court, which could cost a hundred thousand, quarter million dollars. So they pay the ten thousand. That's really unethical. And my advice to those shops that get a letter saying we're going to sue you, toss it out, because it'll cost the company more than ten thousand dollars to go to court just to file the paperwork and hire the lawyers. They're never going to sue you for ten thousand um, dollars. 
so it's an empty thread. The other thing is I worked a couple of years ago, for example, for a company, a bunch of guys from a major semiconductor company went off on their own, developed a really cool uh, game player, uh, patented it, and then and showed it to Nintendo. Now, Nintendo did not copy it, as far as anybody knows, but Nintendo was working on the same thing, and they said, no, thank you, and they came out with their Wii. Well, the guys I was working for, for them, they actually produced products, they had them manufactured, they sold them online, uh, they may have had them in some local stores, I'm not sure, but they couldn't compete against Nintendo, and they had a patent on this. So we went to court against Nintendo, and uh, the press labeled them a patent troll. Even though they produced products, they had a company, they sold them, they, they did sell products, just not enough of them. Um, you know, they had them manufactured. There's no way this would be a troll, but, but in the press, people didn't like them, so they called them a troll. And then there's the kind of troll that, uh, let's say, NPE, non-practicing entity, that buys up patents and asserts them against companies. So let me tell you, I'll tell you my story. I'll make it quick. But this is why I think that these guys aren't, these entities aren't as bad as people think they are. I had a company for years where I sold my software to uh, Mentor Graphics, a pretty big company. And I had a nice little business because they needed my software to sell their multi-million dollar machines into certain markets, in, into networking. They, they made these hardware emulators. They sold for at least for anywhere from one to five million dollars each, but they needed my software. And they'd come to me originally, asking me to solve their problem. And I, and it, I told them I had been coincidentally working on this issue for a while, so I created some, some software that, that they bundled with their machine. But they hated that they buy it from me. I was living in, you know, in, in my house. I developed this in my house. Uh, you know, it was just one person, and it was outside the company. And they used to really give me a hard time. And I said, if you want to buy the, the, the software from me, you can. And then you can maintain it. And actually, originally, I would have sold everything, patents and software to them really cheap because it started as a side project. But the longer it went on and the business built, the more it would have cost them, but they never wanted to buy it from me. And then one year they came to me and said they'd buy it from me. And we negotiated a contract. And when I got the contract, it had different terms than we'd negotiated. So I said to them, I think this is a mistake. They said, no. But one of the terms was I would never, ever, for any reason, accuse them of patent infringement. And I said, you know, I can't, I don't know what I'm going to invent next year. I can't, I can't do that. So the negotiations fell through and they said, well, we're just going to make our own line of products. And we've worked with you for seven years. Well, I don't know if they said this explicitly. They said they're going to make our own products. But I knew they'd worked with me very closely for seven years. They knew exactly how this thing worked. They'd already been putting out products that infringed on my patents, but I never accused them because they were a nice source of revenue. And I figured, why, you know, why go after somebody who's paying me money? But they dropped me all, all together. And I couldn't afford to, and they created their own line of products that were exactly like mine. And I couldn't afford to hire a lawyer to go after them. But I did find that one of these NPEs or quote unquote patent trolls was willing to buy my patents and go after them themselves. And so I made money. My business dropped to zero, by the way. They were at that point my only customer. And, uh, but I got a nice chunk of money from an, from an NPE, non-practicing entity who then did whatever they wanted to with them. And I assume they went after Mentor Graphics and said, hey, now you need to pay us. And we're not a little guy. We're a pretty big guy. Let's take a break from this episode and really quickly talk about finding a job. You know, searching for a job can feel stressful, scary, and time-consuming. Pushy recruiters try to sell you on roles you don't actually want. And the job boards make you feel like you're throwing your resume into a black hole, never to be seen again. And sometimes you go all the way through an interview process just to find out that the very end that the salary offer or company culture doesn't match what you're looking for. Well, there's a solution. Hired.com is the world's most intelligent talent matching platform for full-time and contract opportunities. They make the job search faster, focused, and stress-free instead of endlessly applying to companies and hoping for the best. Hired puts you in control of how and when you connect with compelling opportunities. And after completing one simple application, top employers apply to you. And the best part is, is that you get money. That's right. They pay you if you get a job through them. 
Listeners to this show can earn double their normal hiring bonus by signing up with the show's link. That's right. You get $2,000 instead of $1,000. So go sign up at Hired.com slash Ruby Rogues Podcast. I think it's really interesting just just looking at it from a different point of view because, yeah, I mean, usually what we hear is we hear in the news, you know, some company that doesn't actually make anything is suing all these people because they bought a patent and, you know, they're trying to basically extort money from them. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to know that, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are people out there doing that, but there are also people out there who are, yeah, essentially making sure that, you know, you got something for what you invented and, you know, they are making some money based on the fact that they are then able to take on that risk and go after that company in a way that you can't. Yeah, I think that's the part you don't hear. And, you know, one thing I went to a conference at Stanford Law School and they don't really like patents at all uh, at Stanford. And it was interesting. It was like the whole conference was, what do we do about patent trolls? And it was unbelievable. Everybody that had a patent, we're talking about universities, we're talking about the people who sued the mom and pop shops, we're talking about little small inventors that couldn't get their product to market. Everybody was labeled a patent troll. And I said to them, if you're not going to differentiate between these, what, what's the point? You, you, why don't you just eliminate the patent system? And a few of them said, yeah, that'd be a good idea. Um, so I think you've got to be careful when people label something a patent troll to see what these companies, are they really doing something unethical, which happens? Or are they doing something that's legal and you know could be a service, a good service? We've been talking for a while. And one thing you put in your notes, I'm going to switch gears on us here. Is it because because we have the um, we have our guest fill in the you know a page and you know help us out with what to look into? Um, you put in a question that we should ask you: How did I help Mark Zuckerberg keep his empire? And does he ever thank me? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think there's got to be an interesting story there. Yeah, you know, uh, if you've seen the movie The Social Network, have you guys seen that? Yep, I have. Yeah. Yeah. I love that movie. I've seen it like 10 times. Um, I saw it with a law firm. I saw it with the employees at my consulting company. I saw it with my wife. And sometimes I just sit down and watch it again. Uh, I really like the writer, Aaron Sorkin, by the way. I think it's a great movie. But I tell people I'm in the movie <clears throat> because there's a scene where Zuckerberg at uh, deposition holds up some papers and says, I didn't copy your code. And I say, there I am. That's my report. If you zoom in, you might be able to see my name on it. <laughs> because basically, when I first got into this business, especially with comparing code for copyright infringement, somebody had asked me once to compare some code, and it's really tedious. <clears throat> and the thing is, since we get paid per hour, a lot of experts will say, well, it's tedious, but I get paid per hour. This is a lot of great money. But I couldn't stand it. So I wrote a program to compare code and uh, start audit to automate the process and it, it ended up that caught on i did a lot of research and really did a lot of work and it became a pretty useful tool so i got a call from a law firm years ago and said we've got this case where this startup company has been accused of stealing code and would you we want you to work on it and use this tool that you created so i said great and they they told me the name of the company and i said well okay and then when i hung up uh, I worked out of my house at that time. In fact, my new house, I, well, I think my new house is paid for by Mark Zuckerberg, possibly, uh, because they gave me a lot of code to compare. My wife at the time, you know, like I said, I was working out of my house. She said, who was that? And I said, oh, it's a lawyer for a new case. It's uh, the client, some company called the Facebook. I'm kind of worried. It's a lot of work and I don't know if they can pay. I've never heard of them. So... It, <laughs> They didn't have any problem paying. I was really surprised because they weren't public. And I started learning about them. And I started, you know, what they did, I'll tell you, is they, they gave me all a copy of every disk at Facebook at the time. So you know how small the company was. They, they imaged every computer disk and they gave it to me and they said, search for anything that might look like code. Because the, this law firm, it's uh, Ora Carrington, Great law firm, great partner there. I'll mention his name, Neil Chatterjee. He's given me a lot of work. And the thing I respect is they wanted to know, was there copied code? Some, some defendants don't want to know. But 
in this case, they wanted to know if there was any chance there was any copied code. So they said anything that looks like it might be code, any text file, text file fragment, examine it. So I ran my tool. I learned a lot more about Mark Zuckerberg than, than some people know because I had all this private college communications in there. Um, and, you know, but it was just really interesting. And then when I found out, I wrote a report that said there was no copying. And I can tell you this, I, this was confidential for years, but they finally gave me the okay to talk generally about it, not any specifics. But the Winklevoss twins, uh, who were the guys at Harvard that had talked with uh, Mark Zuckerberg about creating something like Facebook, they hired some experts and they wrote a report that said, uh, well, there were, if I remember, there were 149,000 files of potential source code. So we arbitrarily chose 6,000 and put several people on it to examine them. And we didn't find any copying, but we, we believe there's copying in one of the other 143,000 files. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, that's what you said. To be perfectly honest, before I created my software tool called Code Suite to do it, that's what would happen. You'd say, well, we don't know, or we think. So my report actually said, well, I was able to, in by myself and using my tool, I examined every single one of those 149,000 files and found no sign of copying. And uh, the case settled shortly after that. Now, it dragged on for a long time due to other issues, but the copyright issue basically went away at that point. And, and I ran into Zuckerberg once at the law firm. I just was going down the hall and some kid in a hoodie passed me. And I like said, oh, I, I've seen his picture. I think that's the kid who owns this company I'm working for. Um, but that's the only time I've ever, I didn't quite meet him, but I saw him in the hallway there. Um, you know, but I'm very, you know, I say, did he ever thank me? No, he probably doesn't know who I am, but uh, I'm really appreciative. I, you know, once in a while you get a customer like Facebook and, uh, you know, they, they gave me free reign, carte blanche to do whatever I wanted to, as long as, uh, you know, with regard to the case, and uh, it, it helped my career. Uh, it was very lucrative, and I think I helped justice prevail, which is always the best thing. I'm, one thing I'm very concerned about is I always want to tell the truth, and sometimes I tell clients things they don't want to hear, but I feel an obligation to tell them anyway. So I'm kind of curious, do you ever get then asked by a company to essentially say something that's different from your report? So, yeah, that's this is what makes a job so tough and stressful for me is I tell the lawyers that you have up until the time I sign the report to convince me to add or change something in it. And the, the best attorneys will sometimes argue with me and we'll go back and forth, but they understand that if they can't convince me, I won't put it, you know, I won't put what they want in the report. And, um, but there's a lot of pressure and I understand it. They, they sometimes want to put something in the report that I can't support. And sometimes they can convince me because sometimes they can convince me that if you look at it from a certain angle, or we're talking about like a legal issue, this, this is not uncommon. And it has to do with at the beginning where I talked about the legal definition of creativity with regard to copyright. They might say, you have to say this is creative because it's not copyright infringement unless it's creative. And in the early days, I might have said, but it's not creative. And we'd argue back and forth until they showed me some case law where creative was defined. And then I'd say, oh, OK, under that definition, it is creative and I can say it. So sometimes they convince me. But if they don't, I don't put it in. But I know that there are experts who unfortunately will give in to that pressure and just say things that that the expert's not convinced of. The, the, the thing that happens, what I like doing, honestly, this is what I take the greatest pleasure at, and not in a mean-spirited way, typically, uh, attacking the other expert's findings because they can't, they can't support it. So we usually get a rebuttal report, there's a deposition, and then if it goes to court, it's really interesting. You know, it's a very friendly, you, you know, I'm never... The experts never personally attack each other, and you try not to get angry. It's really bad if an expert gets angry on the stand.
But you say things like, uh, well, the other expert didn't take certain things into account or misrepresented something or, you know, um, it's a good feeling when you can win a case when the other side really is saying stuff that aren't, that isn't right. You know, I'll mention one other thing that's kind of, I had a case uh, one time and I appreciated that the, uh, the attorney on the case appreciated what I did. I was working for a defendant that was accused of stealing code. And of course, the client, my client claimed that no code was stolen. And I did an analysis and I went to the attorney and I said, I have some bad news. There was stolen code. And I showed it to him and explained the reasoning. And he went back to the client. And so we changed the code. We modified the, well, the client did, <clears throat> modified the code. And then the plaintiff's expert said, oh, we found copied code and here it is. And my report, we, you exchange reports at the same time. My report found even more copied code than the plaintiff did. <laughs> wow. Um, and my report said we found all this code and we modified it. So it, it at least mitigates the damages. You know, there's less damages. But I think it also looked good. We were being honest and we had done a better job than the plaintiff did. That's really interesting. So we've talked about a lot of things. Are there other things that we find that, you know, most people misunderstand about intellectual property with software that we haven't talked about or have we covered kind of the big things? I think those are the big things. I know that uh, I was involved in the Oracle Google case recently about the copyrightability of APIs. And there is some misunderstanding there. Uh, basically, APIs are and always have been copyrightable. Uh, there's really no question. The judge in the first case, I don't know if people know, but so Oracle sued Google for using the Java APIs in Android. And there was a lot of controversy that said, oh, if APIs are copyrightable, nobody will be able to develop code. No, that's completely wrong. APIs have always been copyrightable. There's never been an issue, but uh, they're copyrightable, but any company can agree to license them however they want. They can give them away for free. If you've got a copyright, you can say anyone can have them for free. It doesn't mean that people can't use them. But if you've got a copyright, you can do what Sun and Oracle did. You can say, okay, for non-commercial use, you can use it, but for commercial use, you have to pay us. And Google understood this, it came out in court that there were emails saying, hey guys, we need to pay for this. And people at Google said, well, let's not pay. Well, we can't, no, we can't get a good deal from Sun because they tried to negotiate with Sun. So Google said, hey, we can't get a good deal. Let's just use them anyway. And other people said, but we can't, they're copyrightable. And then people within uh, Google said, uh, well, you know, we can figure that out later. They didn't say, no, they're not copyrightable. They said, we'll figure it out later, or we don't care, or whatever. Uh, the interesting thing is it went to trial, and the jury found that the APIs were copyrightable. And the judge made the mistake of overturning the jury's decision, which is really rare, he said the jury got it wrong. Then when Oracle appealed, uh, the, the, the Court of Appeals basically blasted the first judge and said, wow, he didn't understand copyright law at all and went through it point by point on every single thing he got wrong. And so APIs are copyrightable, but there's the fair use, uh, there's, a fair, there's something called fair use in copyright law, which is okay, it's copyrightable, but if you're using it for a good reason, uh, then you can still use it. And fair use is, on the one hand, there's a bunch of reasons for fair use, but it's a little bit gray area. And when I went back to court, Google, you know, I'm going to summarize, this isn't exact, this isn't the exact reasoning, but I was at the court, I, I only worked on the appeal, I didn't work on the original case. At the appeal, basically, Google said to the jury, look, we're so successful with Android, everybody uses Android, Android's great. So it's in the public good to be able to use the Java APIs because everybody loves Java, everybody loves Android. And the jury said, okay. Uh, in my mind, that's kind of like saying, hey, I stole this guy's TV, but I put it out in the park so everybody could watch it, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a very good analogy. <laughs> I like that a lot, yeah. yeah. So... Uh, I mean, it's kind of how they won. But the thing is with fair use, it's such a gray area. I read a great uh, 
analysis by a law professor whose name I don't recall, who said basically once a jury decides on fair use, that's it, because it's not like cut and dried law. It's not like the law says this is fair use and this isn't. It's it's kind of up to it's very subjective. So uh, if a jury said it was fair use, it probably was. It, there's no question anymore. When when we're talking, uh, you know, when I'm working with authors on books and we're talking about getting permission to use a screenshot or getting permission to use a quote from Twitter, uh, you know, there's always that, well, it's fair use. And one of the things we always tell the authors is fair use is, should be considered a defense, uh, right. not, not, a, not a right. So, you know, it's let's err on getting the permission release first. Yeah, I agree. I've got a guy that worked for me that just left the company and he had developed some scripts and some tools that he used. And he asked me if he could use them for his own use. And so we wrote up an agreement that said for his own personal use, he could use them. And I, I know how it is. You work on something. It's really cool. You think it might be useful. Uh, you want to fool around with it. So I, I said, OK, but I did put in there for, not for commercial use. All right. Well, we've been talking for about an hour and that's usually when we start looking at going to picks. Is there anything else that we should uh, dig into with this? Anything else that's going to save some people some trouble or, uh, you know? Yeah, I think the main thing is register your copyrights with the Copyright Office uh, for your source code. So when you've got your program mostly done or, or completely done, register a little chunk with the Copyright Office. You do it online, $35. If you're starting a company, find one thing, the hardest thing that you developed and patent it. And if if you're clever about it and you find the right lawyers or patent agents, you can do it relatively cheaply. And uh, mark every document that might be confidential, that might have some useful business information in it, mark it as confidential if you show it to anybody. And... Make sure that everybody who sees anything that might be confidential signs a non-disclosure or uh, an employment agreement with a confidentiality clause. I tell entrepreneurs, by the way, it's tempting to show your business plan to your friends, to your relatives. Uh, you know, make sure the business plan is marked confidential, and even friends and relatives, you should try to get them to sign a non-disclosure. Because if you go to court and somebody you know, to, to as a plaintiff in a trade secret case, and the defendant says, look, you showed it to all your friends and didn't tell them it was confidential, then you risk losing the case because once you didn't keep it secret, then it's not a trade secret. So I think that's the basic advice for people. All right. Well, if people want to follow up with this or learn more about intellectual property, where should they go? Well, they can go to, they can contact me, Bob at ZeidmanConsulting.com. It's Z as in zebra, E, I, D as in David, M, A, N, Consulting.com. And uh, feel free to send me uh, an email. I, I usually answer emails pretty quickly and I'm happy to help people. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks. Uh, Dave, do you want to start us off with picks? Yeah, sure. Uh, my first pick is Foundation Inc., or it's now called Zerbs Foundation for Emails. It's a templating uh, language for fencing up your emails. So uh, if you ever have a reset password thing that looks ugly, check out Zerbs Foundation for Emails. My second pick, which has been really awesome because I have an unfinished basement and it's really cold down there in wintertime, is the Presto Heat Dish. If you ever go by Costco and you just get hit by this huge wave of heat, it's probably that heat dish turned on. So it's been pretty awesome. Wait, what is this heat dish thing, Dave? Can you just, is it like a, um, you know, it's shaped like a dish and it just radiates heat somehow? Yeah, it's a, it has a bunch of little looping coils and it, uh, I guess it's like a infrared uh, heat and it just kind of projects it out uh, directional. So it's not a space heater, but if you're cold, if you need to warm up quickly, this thing will just, uh, you know, blast you with some heat. I'll post a link to it. And it's electronic? It is. Awesome. And it's only 1,000 watts, so it shouldn't trip any unused circuits. All right, Jason, what are your picks? Okay, I got two picks. 
since Bob didn't plug his book, I'll mention it. Uh, the Software IP Detectives Handbook um, looks pretty interesting. It's probably uh, you know of interest to a, a limited scope of people because um, not a lot of people probably uh, consider themselves software IP detectives. But I just wanted to mention that book uh, since I think it's cool that you wrote a book. No, thank um, you. Appreciate it. Yeah. And I want to mention another book that I've just been devouring recently. It's called Million Dollar Speaking. And it's particularly interesting to me as a historically a freelancer who's trying to get into more real consulting. Um, but I'll explain how it would be relevant to pretty much every software developer, too. Um, if you do speaking and writing as a software developer, it can help your career opportunities. Because A, when you speak and write, you reach more people, so more people become aware of your existence. And then the other benefit is that you, you're perceived as an expert if you write and speak on topics. Even if you're not an expert and you never claim to be, that's the automatic perception that people form when you do those things. So this book, Million Dollar Speaking, it touches on, on both those things. Even though it's a speaking book, it talks about uh, how to get speaking gigs and how to get writing gigs, too. And it's been super interesting for me. I, re I read some of Alan Weiss's other books, too. Million Dollar Consulting was one of them. But I almost feel like Million, Do million Dollar Speaking is better. Um, so I'd really recommend that, not just to consultants, but to pretty much every software developer who's interested in boosting your career opportunities. That's all my picks. All right. Um, Brian, what are your picks? So I have just uh, two picks today. The first is the, a website called Flat.io uh, was introduced to me by a coworker. It's for putting a musical score online and sharing it, working collaboratively with someone else. Um, it's just really cool to be able to uh, you know, do music notation on the web as opposed to doing it in some kind of a cryptic program. And it's nice that you can you can share the score with someone and uh, and play it uh, actually play it online. Uh, to get an understanding of what the sheet music's all about. So that's just kind of neat. And I'm, I'm always going to have some sort of music-related pick every week, so uh, that's this one. The other one, uh, the other thing I've been playing with is an open-source project called HA Bridge. This is a home automation bridge that emulates the Philips Hue lighting system. Um, so one of the problems that you have if you got to launch a lot of, uh, like an Amazon Echo or something like that, uh, you know, it, it's got certain things that it can talk with. Like, it, you, it, it knows how to work with Philips uh, hue light bulbs. You can say, you know, uh, turn on the living room lights. Uh, but the Hue Bridge pretends to be Philips lighting system, but it's actually just an API redirector. It's like a proxy. So uh, it emulates the Philips Hue light system, but it can control our devices like a Vera or a Harmony Hub, uh, your Nest, uh, other light lighting systems, anything that has an HTTP interface. So you can use it to, if you have like a Harmony remote with, uh, with an API endpoint, you can use it literally say, uh, turn on my TV or, you know, change the channel to this, or, you know, you can, you can use it to do all kinds of things. So it's been really great for bridging a lot of these, uh, disparate systems, uh, together. So that's, that's HA bridge. And they'll have a link to that in the show notes. Oh, I think I need one of those. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's completely open source software. You can run it on a raspberry Pi if you need to. Nice. Um, so I'm going to jump in here with a couple of picks. Um, one of the first picks that I have, and I'm not exactly sure. I think I got it on Amazon, but I've got one of these plugs that you plug into the wall or, in my case, into the um, power strip, and it's got four USB plugs on it. Um, this is the kind of thing that I take with me, with me when I travel because everything I have that I have to plug in these days just plugs in via USB. So having something like that is really nice. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I'm also going to be traveling to a few conferences this year, some of them um, for sure, and some of them I'm really thinking about. Uh, one of the first ones that I'm traveling to is MicroConf. In fact, I think I saw Jason <laughs> at MicroConf last year. Um, yep. Yeah, we just passed briefly. It was either last year or the year before, but yeah, um, you know, briefly out in front of the hotel. Um, yeah, we had time to like shake hands and say hi and then walk away. That's right. Um, but yeah, I'm going back this year. Um, I'm actually going to be there a couple days before and one day after. Um, I'm in Las Vegas kind of a lot, so um, it's not this uh, big. Um, Chuck has a gambling problem. 
that's right. Um, that and I only live five hours from Las Vegas, so um, I, I usually just drive down, but my family's actually coming back from Disneyland, and they're just going to leave me in Las Vegas, and I'll fly home. Um, but yeah, so uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Another one that I'm considering going on is Angie Cruise, and it's actually an Angular conference on a cruise ship. And so uh, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to go on that one just because I have to clear it with my wife. Um, and the last one that I'm, I'm going to mention is um, I'm going to Podcast Movement in August. Um, so if you're into podcasting, or if you, even if you're just thinking about getting started, it's going to be in Anaheim this year, Anaheim, California. So yeah, I'm seriously considering actually staying a couple extra days and going to Disneyland by myself. Um, but we'll see how that all works out. Anyway, um, so yeah. Those are all of my picks um, if you want to go to any of those conferences. And then I'm putting on conferences this year. So if you're interested in JavaScript, um, I think this episode comes out a couple weeks before JS Remote Conf. Um, Freelance Remote Conf is in April. iOS Remote Conf is in May. And Ruby Remote Conf is in June. So if you're interested in any or all of those topics, uh, go to devchat.tv slash conferences and sign up. Um, I have speakers up now for JS Remote Conf, and I should have them up by the time this goes out for Freelance Remote Conf. So if you're looking for um, any of those, then definitely go check them out. Uh, Bob, real quick, some... I, I just want to, sorry, Chuck, I just want a second microconf. It's super awesome. I went for the first time last year, and it was so incredibly helpful. So for anybody who runs like a web based business at all, highly recommend it. And uh, Chuck, I'll see you there. Yep. I'll see you there this time, too. Yep, they uh, they actually split it up. So last year it was just one big conference, and this year they have growth and they have starter. So if you're trying to start or you've just started your web business and you're just trying to kind of get it off the ground, then they have the starter conference for two days, and then they have the growth conference for established businesses that are making um, money and are just looking to grow. So uh, those are definitely worth checking out. Um, and so, yeah. You know, it's not just for established web businesses. It's for if you're trying to get started or trying to build your idea or get your idea or whatever, they have a conference for that too. Bob, what are your picks? So uh, I was thinking I'd, uh, you know, I, I'm a big movie fan, so I'd mention some of the movies uh, that are out there that people might be interested in. And uh, I'll mention briefly uh, Sully, which was not nominated for an Oscar, but a really good movie about. Well, in in a sense, dealing with technology that's going wrong, and uh, uh, you know what happens when when a something malfunctions. You know, of course, it's about Captain Sully who landed a plane successfully in the Hudson River. I guess it was uh, in New York, uh, in New York mm-hmm. when his plane failed. And you know, how do you? So it relates to engineering in that uh, how do you handle something that's going wrong and have to make a split decision, and then. Uh, just, just a really good feel-good movie that, uh, but you know, Tom Hanks does a great job as he always does, playing kind of an everyman who becomes a hero. Uh, I also I'll mention briefly La La Land, which I really, really liked. It was a, it doesn't have anything to do with technology, but it was a good movie. It does have to do with music, and uh, you know, I love old '40s and '50s musicals, and you just don't see them anymore. And this was an old '40s or '50s musical with a, a, a really good story, great acting. Great music, I thought, and uh, you know, it, it's not it's not all uplifting, but most of it is, and you feel you feel good, and you want to dance when you come out of it. And then uh, finally, Hidden Figures, which is about the uh, space program, and uh, a really good movie about uh, three African American women and the struggles they faced. But the thing I liked most about it was that it was more about how they overcame their struggles how they uh, you know, fought the attitudes at the time and were successful despite it. And I think everybody can go and feel good. And it, they're engineers and mathematicians. And from everything I could tell, they got the engineering and math right in the movie, which is always a plus. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap this one up. Thank you for coming, Bob. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. All right. We'll catch everyone next week. All right. Bye, See guys. you later. Hey. Bye. Take care. Hey, everybody. This is Charles Maxwood. I just wanted to talk to you really briefly about JS Remote Comp. Uh, we just picked speakers. Things are looking really good. 
and uh, we're really excited to cover a broad range of topics for JavaScript developers. So if you're looking to learn things about Node.js, about becoming a better developer, about deployment, about mobile development, and much more, and much more about JavaScript, then come check us out at jsremoteconf.com. Uh, you can also find it by going to devchat.tv slash conferences and then picking the conference you want. We have last year's recordings there. We have this year's uh, conference coming up. So make sure you get your ticket and we'll see you there. Thank you.